And uh, friends, with, if you wouldn't mind turning in your Bible, please, that Bible that you brought, of course, to church this morning, uh, to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And as we turn our attention to the Bible this morning, uh, let's pray. Let's pray that God will give us the good sense to hear well. Pray together. You remember Jesus once said to his contemporaries, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we pay attention to the scriptures this morning, we may learn of Jesus, come to Jesus, and receive the true life that he gives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, in this brief uh, winter series, we've been dipping into the Old Testament book of two kings. You may have noticed that if you've been with us over the last few weeks. But we've been doing it with what must seem at first to be a strange purpose. I've been suggesting that this book, this rather obscure book, this book that I think most of us have not spent a lot of time in, and I hadn't before I began doing what I'm doing at the moment, but it's in the Bible to help us to understand the truth about our troubled world. That's a big claim, but I'm convinced it's true. Because, of course, this book is actually about what went wrong in the nation of Israel through the 9th through to the 6th centuries BC. And if you've read much of Two Kings, you'll know that a lot went wrong. But I, what I hope we've been seeing over these couple of weeks is that the Bible as a whole teaches us that what went wrong in Israel is what has gone wrong in the whole world in our world. So that as we look at Israel and then look at our world, as we look at our world through the lens that is given to us in this book that is helping us to understand what happened in Israel, we understand our world. Now, of course, these three brief studies are not pretending to provide all the answers, not even all the answers that the book of Two Kings gives us. We just dipped in three times. But we are learning a perspective, a way of getting things into focus that can help us not to be overwhelmed by the complexity of it all. Don't you find yourself doing that at times? What is going on is so so complicated, so confused. And we certainly don't want to be swept along with the tidal wave of chaos that is our troubled world. And so we turn to these scriptures. Now at the heart of what we've been learning over these couple of weeks is this. The truth about Israel in those far off days and also the truth about our troubled world is this, just put it, put it down into a sentence. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, exchanging the glory and the goodness of the immortal God for something else. Therefore, God gave them up. Now, it's not difficult as you read the book of 2 Kings to see that's exactly what happened with Israel. And friends, I don't think it's difficult as we look out on our troubled world to see that's what's happening with our troubled world. Isn't it? Isn't this a precisely accurate description? It's not telling you about everything, not giving you all the answers, not sorting out everything, but here is seeing our world in focus. Claiming to be wise, they have become fools. Now don't misunderstand me, this isn't a sort of superior perspective that we have on our world, that we are better than everybody else or anything like that. We recognise that we are caught up in this foolishness from time to time, all of us. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. In what way? In what, what was the foolishness? Well, they exchanged the glory and the goodness of the immortal God for something else. What could be more foolish than that? 
Therefore, God gave them up. Now, we know that's not the whole story. We know that there is more to be said, but that is fundamental and basic. And the book of 2 Kings helps us to understand the seriousness of that. Now, this morning, for our third and final in this little series, uh, for which, again, I, I need to thank Mickey for inviting me to do this. I've enjoyed doing it very much. If you haven't enjoyed it, take that up with Mickey, not with me. But I have uh, I very much enjoyed being with you and sharing this with you and uh, being forced to focus these things. But this morning I've chosen the brief story that comes to us there that Cam read to us at the beginning of the sixth chapter of Two Kings. Now, if you were paying attention as Cam read, I'm sure you noticed that it's one of those little stories in the Bible, and there are quite a few of them, that perplex Bible readers, that certainly perplexes me. It's a story about an iron axe head that was made to swim. At least that's how the old translations put it. At the end, at the end of verse 6, you see it there? In the old King James Version, it goes like this, and the iron did swim. It's one of the reasons we've got modern translations, I suppose. Our problem, of course, is not whether such a thing is possible. Of course it is. If God can heal the leprosy of a foreign general in an instant, as we saw last week in 2 Kings chapter 5 then he can certainly make a piece of iron float to the surface of the waters of the Jordan River. That's not the problem. What puzzles us is the apparent insignificance of the incident. I mean, it does seem so trivial. We can see that the healing of Naaman's leprosy last week, uh, it, 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 that was a marvellous, wonderful display of the power and the goodness and the kindness of God that brought this foreigner to understand that the God that he encountered in Israel is the one God in all the earth. Later on in 2 Kings chapter 6, we hear about the same mighty power of God protecting his people in an extraordinary way from the terrifying enemies that wanted to destroy them. But here at the beginning of chapter 6, why is our attention briefly turned from these big, obviously significant events, headline events, to the odd story of a floating axe head? So the title I've put on our brief study this morning is this, An Important, Unimportant Story. An Important, Unimportant Story. Here we are, we're back in Israel again. One day in 850-something BC. We've become aware, if uh, you've been reading uh, the passages that we've looked at and those that are around them, that it was a difficult time. Uh, that's an understatement. Uh, strange new ideologies were sweeping through the country. There was unrest, there was division... There was also the very real threat of war. And on top of all that, there was a famine in the land. People were desperately short of food. They were troubled days. Which again adds to the puzzle of our little story at the beginning of 2 Kings chapter 6. At such a time as this, you can't eat a floating axe head. So we're going to try and follow the story as carefully as we can, uh, prepared to be surprised. It begins like this. It begins with, we call this point one, a good problem to have and a straightforward solution. Look with me at verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge... Uh, that could be translated, the place where we sit before you is too small for us. What's that about? Well, the sons of the prophets, as they were called, were not literally the sons of the prophets. Uh, they were people in Israel who had welcomed the prophets Elijah and Elisha. We could call them disciples. And if you've been doing your homework and have been reading the bits in two kings that we have passed over, you will have noticed that there were groups of these disciples in various places around Israel. Earlier on, Elijah and now Elisha, 
would visit these places. The disciples would gather together and they'd sit before the prophet. That's, that's, that's the way it's expressed. He would be teaching them. Uh, the numbers were not huge. Uh, on an earlier occasion, a few years earlier, um, uh, there were about a hundred gathered like this, sitting before Elisha uh, in Gilgal, uh, near the Jordan River. This is probably the same group that we're looking at now. And on this day, they say to Elisha, you see it in verse 1, see, the place where we sit before you is too small for us. The number of those meeting together under Elisha's teaching and his care had outgrown the whatever they had, some sort of rough shelter from the sun and the, uh, and the rain that they'd put up. Uh, the number had outgrown that, that, that place. And so try and picture them there. They're all crammed in. Uh, there are no spare seats, and they're sitting before the man of God. Faithful disciples, learners. And you know, needing more room was a good problem to have. Mind you, it wasn't a revival. The growth in numbers was not huge, so that the solution to their space problem was simple enough. They said to Elijah, look at verse 2, let us go to the Jordan... And each of us there get a log and let us make a place for us to sit there. Let's have a working bee, they said. It won't take long if we all pitch in. Working bees are like that. Uh, we'll be able to put up a new and larger place for our meetings down there in the Jordan Valley where there's plenty of timber. Well, that sounds straightforward enough. Uh, Elisha apparently could see the, the good sense of what they were saying and he responded with one word. I've sort of got the impression he was that kind of guy, just responded with one word he said at the end of verse 2, go. Now I want us to think about this first point for a moment. A good problem to have and a straightforward solution. Because the opportunity to sit before God's prophet it was clearly very important to these faithful people. We don't know how many of these gatherings took place throughout Israel. We don't know how often they were able to sit before Elisha. Uh, again, a few years earlier, God had assured Elijah uh, that there were 7,000 in Israel who hadn't fallen for the Baal fad. But that was still a relatively small number in the whole nation. But you know, it was a lot better than zero, which is what it sometimes felt like. You feel like that sometimes? There aren't many of us. You know, I don't know what it is, but, some, but, but gathered in churches this morning around Sydney, there's about 60,000 people or something like that. It's better than zero. And these humble gatherings, back to our story, in their little log huts or whatever they had, where the word of the Lord was taught by God's prophet, I've got no doubt that these occasions were spiritually rich. And those who came to these gatherings, they knew that there was a God in Israel. Do you remember chapter 1? And indeed that there was no other God in all the earth. Remember last week? How good it was to be listening to his word. We might describe this modest gathering there in Gilgal that we're picturing in our minds at the moment where the people were paying attention to the word of God. Might describe that gathering, mightn't we, as a pillar and buttress of the truth in Israel at a time of confusion and foolishness and fear and trouble, where would a wise person look for answers? To the king? Hardly. To the clever people? No. To the media? Or whatever equivalent they had? I don't think so. So. 
The wise person would join one of these gatherings of ordinary people dotted around the country who sat before God's prophet and listened to the word of God. Would that solve all their problems? Would that answer all their questions? Not necessarily. But they would learn what they needed to know to live well in a troubled world. And I think it must have been very encouraging that their numbers were growing. Now, point two. One man's request. One man's request. So we're at verse three. Then one of them said to Elisha, be pleased to go with your servants. All right, they're going to go down for their working bee. Be pleased to go with your servants. It was a courteous, respectful, but earnest request. Please, sir, would you come with us? I wonder why he said that. I can only think that for this man, the time he was able to spend with the man of God was precious. He didn't want a working bee to take away from the time he was spending with Elisha. Please, sir, would you come with us? And you see the uh, man of few words, Elisha, answered in verse 3, I will go. And verse 4 tells us, so he went with them. I just think those few words are a little glimpse of the warm relationship between the disciples and their teacher. Point three, an unexpected accident and the man's distress. An unexpected accident and the man's distress. We're following the disciples, Elisha now with them, down into the Jordan Valley. Verse four, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. Uh, the working bee is underway. You've been to a working bee? We have them here at St Thomas's from time to time. Uh, well, in this one, the timber was being collected. Uh, there was probably a lot of noise. Uh, there are no doubt men uh, shouting and giving instructions. Do you have that at our working bees? Is that the sort of thing that happens? There's always somebody who knows how things should be done and uh, saying, be careful with that. We need more of this. We need more of that. that, that kind of thing. But our attention is drawn to one of them. And I'm pretty sure it's the very one who had urged Elisha to come with them. So verse 5 says, But as one, literally it says, as the one, was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water. Um, axe head is a reasonable guess by the translators. Literally, the original says, the iron. Because the type of implement isn't all that important for the story here. It's the simple fact that it was made of iron. The point being, of course, dropped into the river, it would immediately sink to the riverbed. But also, iron was very expensive. Uh, it was difficult and very costly to produce. Uh, you go back to 850 BC, an iron axe was seriously high-tech. It's actually a bit surprising that this crowd had access to such advanced and valuable equipment. Uh, in the history of Israel, you read at various points when they didn't. The surrounding nations did, but the, but, but the Israelites didn't. But here, they, 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 they had one, and dropping it into the river was no joke. But it was even worse than that because the, the man cried out to Elisha, you see in verse 5, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Now the man was distraught. And once again, there's a little bit more to it than we immediately realised because God's law required full restitution of anything that was borrowed. If it was lost or damaged in some way. And I'm pretty sure that this fellow was not wealthy. And he could well find himself facing debt slavery. That's when a person unable to pay a debt became a slave to his creditor. This is a serious situation. This little accident, as it might seem to us, this, could be, this man's life might never be the same again. Well, our story ends with, fourth point, a surprising work of God. 
if you read through the first five chapters of two kings uh, an interesting exercise is to make a list and it'll be quite a long list of people who cried out in distress to the man of God and whoever they were whoever they were and whatever their trouble they found that the God of Elijah and Elisha cared on this occasion Elisha you notice in verse 6 how he's described as the man of God the man of God well he responded to the man's desperate cry in verse 6 he said where did it fall and when he showed him the place he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. Elisha's action throwing that stick in the water, that did not itself cause what happened. Um, it wasn't a magic trick, you see. But the action made it clear that what happened next was a work of the man of God. That is, a work of God. And as the iron floated to the surface... Elisha said to the man, verse 7, take it up. And so he reached out his hand and took it. And there's our story. I suppose that the recovery of the axe head was less remarkable than some of the other extraordinary things that have happened in this book. But let's not miss the relief that must have swept over that man at that moment how glad he must have been that he'd thought of urging Elisha to come to the working bee now interestingly our narrator does not now tell us about the completion of the building project we're left to assume that work resumed uh, presumably with the help of the recovered axe which I imagine would be very very carefully wielded from now on uh, the grip would not loosen um, no doubt the job was completed and there was a useful meeting place for the prophet and his steadily growing number of disciples. Friends, I want to think for just a, a couple of moments as we close about the importance of this unimportant story. We turn our attention from that day long ago in Israel to today and our world how does that world help us to see this world how does that world and this little story about that world help us to understand our world I think there are three things as we talk about it afterwards maybe you can see some more things I wouldn't be at all surprised but I, I, but, but I can see three important things that we should take with us the first one is this, gatherings to hear the word of God. In that overwhelmingly troubled nation of Israel, as they certainly were, it seems to me that this little story is told precisely because it is not trivial. The gathering of disciples sitting at Elisha's feet and listening to the word of God and other similar gatherings from time to time dotted around the country. They were more important than kings and palaces and politics and wars. There may not have been many of them. They may not have been strong and influential, but they were the hope of the nation. Because you see, these people had not exchanged the glory of the immortal God for something else. These were the people who had not been so foolish. They really were wise. So, what about our troubled world today? Can we see this? This gathering of disciples here this morning here we are in the promised presence of the risen Lord Jesus you remember his promise don't you where two or three or more 
are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. We meet together like this. The Lord Jesus is with us by his Spirit. As we meet together to listen to the word of God. That's what we're doing. We're meeting together to listen together to the word of God. This is not trivial. Along with other similar gatherings dotted around this world, this gathering here this morning is more important than anything else that is happening in the world today. And that does sound like a ridiculous thing to say, doesn't it? But it was true back then in Israel. And it's true today. There may not be many of us. We may not be strong and influential. Do you know what? Here is where you will find the hope of the world. Not because we're better than anyone else, but because we have not exchanged the glory and goodness of God for something else. Have we? Oh, friends, how good it is to be here. Do you see that? Do you just see that when you decided to come along here this morning, I wonder whether you had to weigh things up and whether the other, but you decided to come here, that was a wise decision. Second, as I look at this little story and I think about then and now I think about now, think about priorities in troubled times. See, this little story took place in a time of famine. Life was really, really hard. Really hard. Do you think it's too much to say that the sons of the prophets were people who had their priorities right? To sit before the prophet. That is, to be nourished by the word of God was something that must not be neglected. Even in a time of famine. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And these folk took the necessary steps to ensure that there was a place where that could happen. Where more and more people could come. Christian believers today, let us take careful note. We too are living in challenging times. In a whole lot of ways. Let's see that we have our priorities right. What we are doing here, now must not be neglected. No matter what else is going on for us, listening to the word of God together is not something we do provided we haven't got anything better to do. Because we haven't got anything better to do. In this troubled world, we need the word of God to sustain us. You troubled about what's happening in the world today? I haven't met anyone who's not. You troubled about how you're going to navigate life in this world at the moment? You're concerned as I am about my grandchildren? How are you going to navigate this? I'll tell you what we need. Above anything else, we need to be hearing the word of God. That will sustain us. Let's be clear about that. Thirdly, God's care. What about the axe head, I hear you ask? Well, we've seen, haven't we, that the floating lump of iron was not quite as trivial as we might have first thought it was to us. But I wonder whether the point of this little story being told here in the midst of political turmoil and all the rest that was going on is simply this. The sovereign power and goodness of God in the midst of all that we see going on 
the God who really does rule over all the turbulence of the world. As it was quite clear if you read around this story that God and his powerful goodness and sovereignty ruled over all the, all the big things that were happening in the world. But the powerful goodness and, uh, of God also extends to the details of his people's lives. You see, we can, as we often do, and quite rightly say, God is sovereign. God is ruling over it all. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. God has got it all under control. That's true. Jesus Christ is Lord over all things in heaven and on earth and everywhere else. That's true. But we can also say that he cares about my little, relatively trivial anxieties today. Like a lost axe head. It makes perfect sense, you see, friends, to cast all my anxieties on him. Whatever they are. There is absolutely no doubt that Many of us, I suspect most of us, have come here this morning with anxieties. The God who rules over all things. You can cast those anxieties on him. You can bring those anxieties to him. Why? Because he really does care. Really. That's what he's like. Remember the axe head. So it's an important little story. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this small part of your wonderful word. And we pray that as we hear this little story of these days so long ago we would hear well we would learn and we would be faithful disciples of the Lord Jesus we pray this in his name Amen